Tonight's program is one I've been uh, looking forward to, but and what I wanted to do is be able to ask questions of some guys who've been around and calling and dancing for a long time. And well, you got them there. I also wanted to videotape this, so I'm going to be running the videotape, and Don's going to moderate it. Uh, I've prepared all of them with a set of questions that I thought of and, and talked over with a couple of people, but you should feel free to, you know, if you have questions, interrupt and so forth. If you don't believe what they're saying, you should let them know. Okay? And there's a lot to get through, so hopefully we won't spend a long time on any one point. And we have, I know, some old records and stuff from uh, the Jim brought. What's your charge for the music copy? I don't know. Depends on how good. I mean, for the only copy. <laughs> <laughs> no, for the other only copy. Yeah. Huh? Okay, Clark uh, called me a week or two ago and said, uh, reminded me that we were having this program about old timers, good old days anyway, and asked me if I would moderate it. And I thought that would be great because I get a chance to hear firsthand from real up close what the good old days are like. Mm -hmm. And I, I so. enjoy hearing stories like that. He was saying, you know, we ought to talk about things that happened 20, 25 years ago. And I said, Clark, I've been calling for 24 and dancing for 29. When you're talking the good old days, you've got to go back further than that. So. He and I at the time discussed a number of things and what further than that was, and our panel does qualify for that. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, they read the history books more than the rest of us. Anyway, I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to have them briefly introduce themselves and let us know when they started dancing, when they started calling why they started dancing, or as Clark put it, who dragged them to their first dance, uh, and why and how they got started calling, and try and keep that brief, and then we've got a number of things that hopefully will get us heading in the right direction of the proper kind of reminiscing. Um, starting on my right with uh, Tom Potts. Well, I'm the newest one of the three here, and uh, I start, we started dancing in the late 1958, and um, after eight lessons, which is all it took to become a club level, a 12 of a hot shot club, I believe, with eight lessons became club level, uh, we were dragged off to a round dance class. And after three round dance lessons, they dragged us back to the club and said, you learn it easy. You are now officially the club round dance teacher. So I became a round dance teacher. Found very quickly that I needed to know things that I didn't know. Went to Earl Johnson and Al Bunch's first caller school. And uh, not to learn to be a caller, but to learn to know the things that a caller needed to know that I felt a round dance teacher should know. When I came back, I came back to a club that was in real trouble and <laughs> decided to go underground and dance a tape for six months while the class, the club ran a new class. And I was down dancing with them and they said, oh, you didn't call our school, you can help us with the tapes. The next thing they said, well, why don't you just get a record and, and walk us to the music a little bit, because after all, you've been to call our school, you can help us. And the next thing you know, no one brought me tape. And so I was now a caller. Uh, Nine o'clock at night, we'd start to go to two in the morning. And by the time the class graduated, I was the second caller for the club. And I had been the caller with the club for, uh, it's about 1962, I've been the um, second club caller and the club caller with the club ever since then. That's how we got into it. Now, the first dance we got to, we got dragged to. What club now? Fine Star. The club is now 30 years old, and uh, they celebrate their anniversary. Did they, did you say they were in existence before that? The time? club started out, a group of dancers learning to dance to records. They didn't have a call. And then several, no, several members went to uh, Hoagie's Color Store, Pete's Barn, and then they decided they had to have some guinea pigs to practice on, and they had a class. And we were in their first class. So they were three lessons ahead of us, and uh, we went from there. Next, uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, <laughs> Jim Mayo. <laughs> my, uh, my sister went off to work in 
Dublin, New Hampshire, and sent an emergency call back to send the kid up to dance with her because she didn't have a partner. So I got sent up to be her partner in 1947. Lucky, <coughs> 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 I'm And <coughs> turns out the caller was a gentleman by the name of Ralph Page. <coughs> and I danced pretty much every week that summer. Uh, the next year I went off to college and the outing club the college had a senior who was a caller and they looked around and said, oh, Mayo, you know how to square dance. Why don't you learn to call this summer? So you can be our, our caller. So in 49, I went to Ralph Page's caller school. No, it wasn't a caller school really. It was a folk dance camp and he had a, a one hour session in the afternoon to teach people to call. And I started calling with his orchestra because there were no records in those days. We, you know, I don't know how we made music other than bows and arrows. But uh, <laughs> they, uh, I got to call my first dance with, with his orchestra in back of me and got back to college and started calling for the outing club. Uh, took my records and went to church couples clubs meetings, you know, the, the young people groups, because those were always deadly affairs. And after people sat around for an hour looking at each other, if you said, well, you know, I, I know how to call square dances, would you mind? Oh, get your records. And that's how I got my first practice. Because uh, they were so bored that they were willing to put up with almost anything by then. <laughs> uh, while I was in college, I was down in El Brundage country, and he used to run a, a Sunday workshop. When I started with Ralph Page, it was traditional dancing. There was Western didn't exist, at least not to my knowledge. Uh, it turns out, I think it was 49, that the Pappy Shaw had his first gathering of callers, and from this area, Brundage went, so did Ralph Page, a little known fact, and Charlie Baldwin was there. Uh, Ralph came back from that, and I was dancing up there in the Dublin Town Hall the night he decided he'd try an Alaman bar. And he called it directionally, nobody had any trouble doing it, they all walked right through it although they didn't really do things directionally very often. The only variation that Ralph ever put in his program was to change an Alaman left to an Alaman right every third week. Uh, other than that, you could recite his program from beginning to end, and he called it the same every single night. And I used to go three times a week for a couple of years dancing to him each summer. But uh, Al got hooked on Western dancing, uh, the variation on the improvisation of it, and he was running Sunday workshops at that time to teach people the new way of doing square dancing. And in the mornings before those Sunday workshops, he ran caller schools, and that's where I met Earl Johnson. We were both going to Al's caller school. We were both young upstart kids that the adults didn't want to dance with, but uh, we went to those for a while, and that's where I got started in calling. Uh, I didn't come back here until I was an experienced hand. I started the first club in, in this area was the Alamant 8s in 1956, and by then I'd been calling seven, eight years. I could almost stand to listen to myself. Your turn. Joe Casey. Okay, our dates are pretty much the same as Jim's. My first encounter with square dancing was in Redden, Vermont in the fall of 1947. Uh, at that time they would build a barn, run dancing in it until it paid for itself. Then they'd put the hay and the cows in. This was in October, and the cows were getting pretty cold by then. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I, I saw enough, or enjoyed it enough, so that I said to myself, if I ever have a chance to get involved in square dancing, I will. The following summer, Trails End Cottage Court opened in Salmonville, New Hampshire, and uh, I heard about it, so I went, and I've been dancing ever since, and that was the spring of 48. Uh, initially, we started dancing to records, uh, mostly Ed Durlock is up there, uh, but one of the fellows started calling, we, we then danced to live music. Uh, I had always enjoyed dancing, always enjoyed music, singing, and a lot of our dancing was singing calls, and uh, I would be singing them along with the call. And the caller noticing this asked me if I wouldn't like to try it. 
being young and foolish? I said, yes. <laughs> so in, uh, I think it was November of 49, I called my first tip. And Jim said he had Ralph Page's orchestra behind him. I, too, had live music, uh, one banjo. <laughs> Howard Gerald playing banjo. Uh, we were not dragged to dancing, and uh, we kind of fell into calling. Uh, it was uh, one of these things that was enjoyable. I didn't get too serious about it. Uh, I thought I was great. Because when I went in the service, I, I have it on my service record that I was a square dance caller. Even though at that time all I did was singing calls and some contras and quadrilles. Uh, we really didn't get involved in calling modern uh, dancing until we were uh, asked to be the club caller for the Down East Western Square Dance Club in uh, 1956. Now, they had been in existence probably, <coughs> I'm guessing, four years, I think, probably at that time. And pr prior to my being asked to be the club caller, they had danced to records. And they had a reputation that you wouldn't believe. They were known nationwide. Uh, and they hired the traveling callers who came in, and they would call anything they wanted. Because they were dancing uh, Les Goach's Hash and Breaks. Uh, you could throw on Bob Oz with Riptide, and they would do it like nothing, right? They were good dancers. Uh, how they ever put up with me initially, I'm not sure. But uh, that was where we got started in uh, modern square dance calling. The following year, we became club caller for the wagon wheelers in uh, Newbury at Pete's Barn. And then the following spring, we became the club caller for the Old Town Squares, uh, also in Newbury at Pete's Barn. And they are still in existence, and they are celebrating their 30th anniversary this spring, and we've been their club caller for the entire 30 years. Uh, I think maybe that covers who I am. <laughs> can I throw a couple of comments in on names in there? I was going to ask you, maybe you can pick up on this. We've had a couple references to Pete's Barn. I have no idea what that is. Was that okay. one of your comments? Um, I don't know how involved you want to get. Initially, uh, initially uh, in our area, the modern dance came out of the Down East Westerners. The, Modern movement. A couple moved in, uh, Navy people, and started a group to wreck it. Uh, eventually, they hired Howie Davison to run a class, and then they hired Howie Hogue to run a class. And some of you may have seen me shake my head when Tom said they learned to wreck it. They may have, but they also had four couples who came to Kittery yeah. from the Barn right. uh, yeah, Regularly in Kittery. Yes, uh, to the classes up there prior to going to his other ones. Um, Pete Noyes was someone from Newburyport who went to Kittery, came back, fixed his barn up for dancing uh, out on Green Street. And there was at one time three clubs dancing there every week. Yeah. The, the comment I was going to make was about Ed Durlacher, whose name got mentioned there. Ed had put out a series of records. He was a, a big, chunk, not a big, he was fairly short, but chunky, red-headed guy and full of him and vigor, he put out <coughs> a set of records that were used in most schools at the time for teaching. And, and if you learn square dancing in schools, which most did at that time, you learned to his records. But I was, I had a job in New York one summer, and Ed had a contract with the Pepsi-Cola company to call at the uh, city parks. And he called it a different one each, each night in a different borough. He did one at Jones Beach, one in, in Manhattan, one out in the Queen and Bronx. And at, I went to him both uh, in Central Park and out at Jones Beach. Absolutely astounding to watch this guy take a thousand people off of the boardwalk at Jones Beach who had never square danced before and have them dancing in no time at all, having the time of their lives. But he did that for a thousand new people each night of the week all summer long, uh, courtesy of Pepsi-Cola Company. It was the most marvelous sell for square dancing that you could ever imagine. And I wish we could find some way to repeat it. Uh, can I make one other comment? Yep. I, and the, it's not, at the time, 
these fellows and I were starting out in calling, uh, the caller did everything. He not only did the calling, if there was round dancing, he taught the round dancing too. He did everything. Contras, squares, rounds, made the coffee, and, and what else have you. Uh, in some of the clubs, the uh, caller came in, turned the heat on, swept the floor, set up the coffee. Uh, they lugged him the tonic. Uh, Took him a half an hour to get his equipment in. Bring his equipment. Yeah, equipment. The amplifiers were large and heavy and multiple parts. They were put like an old-fashioned stereo. <coughs> everything was in a separate box. He set this whole mess up and then lugged in records, two, three, four, five cases like the one Jim has here. And he lugged it in alone and set up. And by then, they did, you're lucky the heat came up. <laughs> you were lucky. <laughs> and then he called the dance and he packed this whole mess up and went home. Uh, the caller did pretty near everything. Even though it was a club, um, he was a worker. We hadn't trained him up by $10. When, when yeah. did the club, as we know them now, integrate in, and were there some of those along with caller run only, and how did, how did the evolution of the, the club run club fall into place? Uh, I, I think that the, the club movement, as we know it now, uh, came into being probably uh, close to the mid-50s in our area. Uh, prior to that, uh, there were club-run dances, and probably the organized dances would be at your college groups, as Jim spoke of. I know UNH had the Durham Reelers, I'm sure Tufts had one. Uh, there were college, per se, groups. Uh, the clubs, though, uh, really didn't get rolling until early 50s. I think, I think the clubs actually came out of the uh, meeting with Pappy Shaw. Mm -hmm. Brundage came back from that and started clubs in Connecticut. Uh, the Connecticut Club and the Hartford Square Dance Club, now the Greater Hartford Square Dance Club. Al started uh, right after he came back from that. He was operating a Saturday night dance in a hall that he owned, the Stephanie Barn, down in Stephanie, Connecticut. And he started the Connecticut Club dancing on Friday nights there and recruited out of his traditional dancers those people who were willing to do a little bit more. Uh, and that's where I found out about clubs. When I came back to this area, I happened, well, there was, no, it was a, a caller run, a brundage of Ralph Page dance in Hollis, where I met a guy who had just moved in to be manager of Newbury's in Manchester. He had started and operated the Barry Vermont Club, which had been going for a while. And those ideas, the, the idea of a square dance club, I think came out of the West uh, and came into New England that way. Before that, when I started dancing in 47, there weren't any clubs. There, Ralph Page ran dances, and he ran them four or five nights a week. And he hired the hall, brought his orchestra, and that's the way it was. The club movement came with modern dancing in the early 50s. Brundage told us at the first college school with the Connecticut Club, he ran a class which he sponsored at the, barn. At, at the barn. When he got done, he called the people in the class together and he said, now if you had hired me to teach this class, I would have charged you X dollars. As it was, I collected Y dollars. The difference is somewhere around $300. He says, I'm putting $300 on the table. You go form a club, and there is your kitty to start the club with. What? And their club rules to this day say at the end of the year, everything over $300 in the kitty is a bonus to Al. And they start each year with $300. That's what it was then, not where it is now. But so each year, at the end of the year, whatever's over this basic kitty is a bonus to Al. And the club starts off each year with a fixed amount. That's the way he set the club up. Some of you mentioned that you went to weekly dances or multi-weekly dances. Tom mentioned that he went to classes for a rousing eight weeks. Twice a month. Both were long. Yeah, I, was, I get in turn again, I mean, after all. When did, when did classes start as such, how, or versus when you just went and got dragged in? And if you got just dragged in and danced, how long did, how many times did you go before you felt proficient? 
how many classes you go through now before you feel proficient. It's an interesting observation that uh, I've made many times that we talk about how in traditional dancing used to welcome everybody in. You could learn in one night, baloney. Not true. Uh, there were very few calls, but the way you measured whether you had been accepted into the group was how well you could swing. And they checked that out in the contra dances because you got to dance with everybody in the contra. And if you couldn't swing well and went toward one of those old guard squares, it evaporated before your very eyes <laughs> or filled instantly. You couldn't get into it. And it took me about two years before I was allowed to dance <coughs> with the good dancers. There were lots of little clubs, and to join them, you had no matter what. Exactly way. true. When I started the, the Element Eights, I taught five lessons. And the fifth night, I really had run out of stuff to teach. You're, you implied that contra dancing was part of the regular square dance program. In traditional. In traditional. In traditional. But, but that was the time when Western didn't exist. What I think from what It you're never saying, was part of, of Western dancing. When, when, did the, when was the split? Was round dancing always part of that? Did, am I missing something besides round dancing, square dancing, contra dancing? We had line dancing in flux for a long for a while. Folk dancing. Folk dancing really yeah. was the round dancing of the traditional era. Uh, things like you had gay gardens on, which is folk dance, Scottish folk dance. Uh, Scottish folk dance. Uh, we taught our first round dance class, I think, in 1950. Yeah, I'm going to say eight. It may have been seven, but I think it was 1958. We taught a formal round dance class. What year? I think it was 58. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Uh, but oddly enough, there was no cueing at that time. Uh, a person learned the dance, and you were on your own. They, you put the music on, and the, the person either knew the dance or didn't, and they made it or didn't. Uh, at that time, there was no cueing. And I can't really tell you exactly when cueing started. Maybe Tom can. Uh, well, we learned we learned from Lou and Ginger Brown, and, and Ginger was not a caller, which was rare. And most rounds were taught by callers. There were very, very few people who were round dance teachers. There was Barbara Smith, and Chet was a caller. Uh, Lou and Ginger, and there were <coughs> one or two others. But they were it's very, very few and far between people who taught nothing but round. And many of them didn't even know Doyle. Doyle. Dick was a caller. Yes, I know. But Dick was a caller. So was Ray Anderson, Dave So were Ray the Platts, and everybody else were <laughs> callers, too. Charlie uh, and Edna go way back to yes. Yeah, but they were both callers. Both were callers. Edna was a caller also? Oh, yes. Definitely. Uh, Philly, he's talking about. Yeah, Philly. To, to, add a date, to add a date, maybe when some of the queuing came in, I know that I was originally dancing in the Western Mass area of Springfield, and there was no queuing for the rounds out there. No. And I wasn't round dancing at the time, but used to enjoy listening to the music anyway. And in 66, when I moved to the eastern part of the state, there were cures. So it was strapped uh, in the early, early 60s. Yeah. And, early, and, and, my early feeling, 60s. and my feeling at the time, <laughs> not being a round dancer, was why are they making all that noise when I could be listening to the music like I used to in Springfield? In, <laughs> in the early 60s, Barbara Smith started to queue at Bay Pad. And I started queuing at Newton Pavilion. And it was on a, I guess Barbara did it all the time. They owned the hall. There was no argument. Uh, when I did the first queuing, and if you wanted a dance queue, you had to go to the caller and ask the caller if he'd queue it. And of course, he couldn't. So he'd say, well, I can't. And then they would say, do you mind if Tom queues it? And he had to give permission for anyone to enter the stage. And he was the caller. Right. And then he would give permission for me to go on the stage and queue around. I had to get individual permission. Now, the fact that I worked for the commercial hall as part of the staff put a great deal of pressure on some callers who would like to have said no, because the, <laughs> I think only one caller all the time ever said no, and he never got hired back. So it didn't take very long before this got learned that if you got asked, especially by the management, that the answer was always yes, and that it took about two to three years before um, queuing was automatic and the caller didn't get asked, he got hired and told that they would be queuing and the queuer would be there and take care of it. But so, so I would guess it would be mid-60s before queuing was common, and then it was only common there. Jim, you were doing some queuing in Chester about then. Uh, Joe did some, some queuing with his group. 
but there was very little queuing. It was not every dance you got queuing yet, only a, only a very limited number. Mike, you had a question? Yes. Um, you talked about uh, Happy Shaw um, having a, a meeting about Western style dancing and that sort of introducing Western dancing to the area. To me, the difference between traditional and Western, the, the thing that strikes me the most is traditional dancing is done on the phrase and Western isn't. And I just wondered, was it right from the beginning, right from that meeting, that uh, Western style dancing wasn't on the phrase of the music? In New England, it was. Okay. Uh, particularly with selected figures, uh, Alamo style being the most notable one, people from the Western practitioners of <coughs> Western dancing didn't know from phrase. We New Englanders danced everything on the phrase in traditional, and those of us who started calling were traditional dancers and traditional callers, uh, many of us. And so we didn't give up our phrase very easily. It was one of the criticisms that Ed Gilmore leveled at me when I went to his caller school in 59, is that I had to kick this silly phrase. Uh, but uh, it's strange to hear Ed Gilmore saying that. <laughs> No, by 1965, 60 or 65, he was pushing the phrase back. One of the, uh, moving down memory list here, and Ed Gilmore's uh, thought on this, one of the questions that Clark thought might be interesting, or a couple of them are, when did dancers just dance at their own area, or did they travel from one club to another? And, and I think more interesting to us probably is did callers just call in their own area or travel? Um, Ed Gilmore is somebody that, Hopefully, you've all heard of to some extent, but probably not to as large an extent as, as some of our panel. Um, he was not a New England area caller, but had a lot of influence over him. Uh, I think I want to, let's ask Joe about dancer traveling and then Jim about caller traveling. Okay. Uh, <coughs> basically, uh, going back again to, to Kittery. Uh, Prior to, uh, well, even back in 50, 54, 55, in that era, uh, they would travel. Uh, we'd travel with them. Uh, we used to go to Square Acres, uh, we going there for Fenton Jones, and uh, also in Gilmore. Where was Square Acres? Square Acres in East Bridgewater, Mass. It's <laughs> <was a, laughs> another whole story all by itself. Uh, okay. uh, where was Benton Jones from? Benton Jones is from, uh, where is he from? Texas, Texas I believe. Yeah. Uh, and of course, Kittery used to hire the college in, but we would travel to uh, Square Acres or up to Barden's Barn in Lebanon, New Hampshire. <laughs> it was run by Neil Barden, a, a caller, uh, to dance because there wasn't that much modern dancing available. You had to travel if you wanted to go other than your own club. I'm digressing from the list slightly, but you're traveling to Barnes when was there dancing in schools and churches at the time? Or when did that creep in? Mid fifties when there were three clubs really in this area in 56, 57. Down East Westerners, the Element Eights and Dick Steele's group in Lexington, yeah. Minutemen. Yeah. And that's, that's what there was, and the active dancers traveled to dance with those groups as soon as they were available. Did they dance in schools? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or public halls. Yeah. YMCA's. Uh -huh. But for my, where I was, the, if we wanted to dance on a Saturday night, and then we couldn't dance every Saturday night, we had to go to Kittery or down to Baypack, generally, uh, to find a dance. Uh, occasionally, the local clubs had a dance. Matter of fact, one time there were four clubs. Um, a little few years later, there were four clubs, and they divided up, and there was one had one each Saturday night they could dance. That was uh, mid '60s, I guess, when the Amesbury Club was running. Carriage set. Carriage set. Oddly Amesbury. enough, I, I think the three clubs that Jim named, you probably could trace most most every active <coughs> club in the area back to one, one of those three clubs. Probably. Uh, some of them it might be a long roundabout route, but basically people who danced and traveled to dance in these clubs went back to their own areas and started clubs. Then was, a, for instance, Ed Ross Smith, who we all knew. He and Judy came to, uh, they were dancing, I think, to Bill Baxter, but they came to Kittery to dance. 
uh, they went back and started the Wenham Shindigas. And I suspected from the Shindigas, you've got several clubs in that area. Um, the same thing would be true from Alaman Bates. They would have traveled to, let's say, Haverhill, started one. And then Nashville. people from there, okay, Nashville. Then Haverhill, and then Lowell, and from Lowell, Methuen, uh, west of the whole, you know. You could trace them all pretty near back to these three clubs. No, I, I can't say that entirely because someone mentioned Charlie and Ed and Tilly. Now, Charlie started, what, Seaside Steppers? And Top Show. And Top Show. Yeah, we had another one. Uh, Yankee Trolls. Yeah. Yankee yeah. Trolls. A lot of the activity in the North Shore can be traced back to Ed and Charlie's uh, work with callers uh, through the Callers Co op, which was another callers organization in the area other than Tri State. We. Uh, Looks like we ought to schedule another time. <laughs> we still got plenty of time, but we got plenty of questions, and they're getting better, I think, all the time. As well as I know these gentlemen have brought in some, some interesting show and tell stuff, and particularly, I think, some of the audible show and listen stuff that I, we probably want to get to. But let's have Jim give us uh, some stuff on traveling callers. How much did the callers in this area travel out of the area? Let me just pick up one name that's <laughs> very important to Tri State. Uh, who hasn't been mentioned yet and should be, his name is Warren Pop, mm. Because Tri-State started really with Joe and Warren and myself getting together to say, gee, you know, we're the only three callers in the area. We ought to try to promote other callers and, and start an organization. We met in Warren's living room and talked about it, and that must have been somewhere in the 57, 58 arena. I think we actually got underway in... 1960, I'm not sure exactly, but yeah, yeah, that would be right. it was about that era, and Warren <coughs> Pop uh, was calling, and as I understand it, I, I think I'm right, that uh, his boss finally put it to him that he could have either a job or his calling. Well, his and boss was also a caller. His really. boss was a caller, and there was a, perhaps a little bit of jealousy there. But uh, Warren, for whatever reason, uh, gave up calling and didn't continue, but he was certainly started out in the same group and with the same frequency and activity that Joe and I were, uh, but for some misfortune, he'd be here tonight, I'm sure. Oh. Extremely you, popular call. When you I talk think. about three calls in our area, what yeah. area are you talking Tri -state about? Tri-state area. Tri-state area. Modern, modern call. Yeah, where, traditional calls were all over the place. Where is, we, you know, the yeah. name I haven't heard you mention too much, where was Charlie Baldwin in all this? South, South, South Shore. Shore. Oh, okay, so you're not considering that as the same area. Uh, Oh, Warren Pop was, had moved to this area uh, from Abington, Mass., which is on the South Shore, uh, to become club caller for the Square Riggers, which was a club in Keats Barn, and also uh, got a job uh, for her, working for Harry Pike. Uh, Harry Pike was his boss. He wasn't uh, the owner of the company. But uh, once he got to the point where he became a sales manager, I believe, nationwide for the company, I believe, is, is why he had to give up his calling. His job got just too much. And it's too bad because he was he was unique. He was excellent. Dancers loved him. Back to the traveling caller issue, uh, there was a circuit established pretty well uh, which included the, the major barns that were operating in the area, Bay Path, uh, Hoagies down the South Shore, Barden's Barn up in Lebanon, and then they went on out of New England by way of northern Vermont and into Canada. And the callers could come in and work each of these barns on a weekend. And in that time, it was also beginning to be true in the late 50s and got much more so in the 60s that a caller could come into New England and spend three weeks here and work every night. Would call the barns on the weekends and club workshops or dances in areas away from the barns on the weekdays, nights. And uh, it was a very standard routine. There were a group of traveling callers. Uh, names that are prominent now, many of them ended up in, in Bob Osgood's Hall of Fame. They were the callers that were known in the area, and one of the primary reasons that they were known in the area 
uh, was Al Brundage. Are you signaling? No. Not to me. Okay. <laughs> Al Brundage was <coughs> starting to run weekends and week-long institutes. He ran Funstitute at uh, the Hotel Fair at West Point. And he would hire callers that he had met on the West Coast or out, out in the West to come in and work the staff of those weeks. They would travel to there by way of the rest of New England and would call for clubs on their way there. And the names that uh, were most prominent there, Gilmore obviously was one of the early ones. Al also used to run weekends at the Hotel Green in uh, Danbury, Connecticut. But uh, Ed Gilmore was the premier. There were, there were two traveling callers everybody recognized as the outstanding ones, and they hated each other. <laughs> Ed Gilmore and Les Gotcha. They had totally different approaches to what square dancing was and how it should be run, and they both traveled full time. They were both extremely popular and were leaders in their own right in very different ways. Uh, but they were, Al hired them both. That's one of the things that made Al different. Is he was able to stay on speaking terms with both of them at the same time. Nobody ever really understood how. But Al brought in most of those callers initially. They then developed a circuit and used to come through at the same time every year, uh, call for the same groups and go on out, out through the way. The, the busy ones came twice a year. Uh, that group included Frank Lane, uh, Johnny LeClaire, uh, Bruce Johnson used to come every summer from California. Max Forsyth. Max Forsyth came from Indiana. And Marshall Flippo later. Marshall was, was later into the business. Uh, Joe Lewis from Texas was uh, very famous and, and very arrogant. Came with his accordion, with, with which he made mystical music. It was just marvelous. He, he was his own orchestra and played this accordion which he had specially rigged to do all kinds of fancy sound effects. I think it was the original uh, synthesized music. Yes. But uh, Joe is still active. Uh, he told me uh, about the, the, the nicest job he ever got. It took him an hour and a half to do the job, and they paid him $5,000. It was for General Dynamics at Fort Worth. Uh, Joe takes that kind of business. He doesn't mess around with club stuff. He can't afford to. <laughs> But uh, those callers, those uh, well-known traveling callers, were largely so because they did the weekends. They were hired <coughs> principally by Al and by the Barnes. Or Beckett, yeah. Cam Beckett was uh, hooked into the traditional uh, initially, but uh, also branched out and, and opened their minds uh, to this modern stuff. Uh, some of the folk dancers were not so generous about modern square dancing, but uh, some were, uh, so be it. But some of the other names that uh, Kittery used to hire were Jack Livingston, Butch yeah. Nelson, yeah. Buzz Brown, Ben Baldwin. Uh, yeah, Many of those came along, once, once the word got out that New England was a gold mine, uh, a lot of callers started coming through, and some of them eventually ended up not being really very well qualified. Were any of the New England callers I assume Al was one that traveled the circuit on other parts of the country. They, Earl and Al could have. They mostly didn't because they couldn't afford to. It was too profitable for them to stay home. None of the places outside of New England could afford to pay them enough so that they could afford to leave their clubs because they were working for big groups in those days. It, it was routine to have 25, 30 squares uh, on weekends, and their weekday clubs were running close to that. In the early 60s, wasn't, uh, wasn't Earl's Club out there in Springfield running 90 squares or something like this? Yeah. Barbara, but I would like Barbara, to. Barbara, Barbara wanted to do something. Uh, uh, I think it would be nice, Tom, if you could talk about some of the local barns that really had quite an impact on our local activity. Uh, the Livery Stable in Amesbury, Newton Pavilion in Newton, New Hampshire, the little barn up in Chester that, that produced a lot of dancers. <clears throat> in Chester because they ran classes and they ran um, um, caller school up there. Jim ran caller school up there and that had quite an impact 
on the activity in this area. Newton did not run classes. We ran a round dance class up there, one of the first in the area. And um, uh, Joanne and her husband, Chuck Silloway, ran round dance classes at Chester, and that also had a big act, uh, impact on the round dance activity in this area because other teachers came out, both those groups. Many of the people that are teaching now came out of one group or the other. Um, what I was thinking we might do now is maybe get one more question from Tom and take a quick, if there are any comments, and try and then get to uh, have Jim do some, some of the sounds that we were being entertained with during the break. Before I ask Tom, because there are some subjects that we haven't covered, I'm going to sort of jump on one. But Charlie's. I would. Opinion. I'd like to know what kind of choreography was being done. That was one of the topics we were going to try and get to the choreography stuff soon. I want to. Okay. So if we can move along, so we can get to that. Have you got a quick one? Yeah, I just have a quick question. How, in those days, were the dancers informed of that there is square dancing that you should join? I mean, how did people get to these places? Did they hear it by word of mouth, or you know? The magazine existed in this area from 55, was it, or something like that. somewhere around there. So the, the New England Color magazine existed throughout most of this period that we're talking about, uh, from the start of, of modern Western dancing in, in New England. How was that accepted into, was it started by Paula or Sweden? Charlie Baldwin. Oh, Charlie, Charlie Baldwin and, and Al Brundage and Dick Doyle, Dick Doyle and one uh, Dick Davis, Davis, too. Met, I think formed a corporation to start publishing a magazine specifically for that purpose. Right. One other comment on this traveling caller thing. Early issue. Uh, Chester, uh, not, well, Chester to a smaller degree, I think, but Bay Path Barn and Newton Pavilion both brought a traveling caller in essentially every week, every Saturday night. And then you had 52, or, yeah, 52 pretty there, sometimes 50, different callers a year each of those barns, and they didn't have the same color because they, they weren't they were too near, they'd compete. Although they were repeats different times of the year. Well, they ran consecutive Saturdays without any great Sometimes. Bay Path of Newton they, in front of the They barn. brought in, uh, this This was the start of the era of the high level, a uh, high number of traveling callers. Before that, there were probably <coughs> eight or ten traveling callers that came into the area um, during the course of a year. After this happened, there was a traveling caller in here all the time. Uh, several people, um, I know about Ginger Brown, there were a few others, uh, square dancers or the like, the callers actually took care of it like a booking agency. And the caller would come and stay with them, and they'd have already done their book, their entire itinerary. So the caller would just come, stay with them, and then hit all the spots that had been booked for them, and then move on to the next dancer who would establish the itinerary. So the call, many of these callers didn't even have to go through the booking process, these traveling callers. They would come in and their nights, their whole night, including transportation, had all been laid out before they got here. Jim, on your stuff that you have over there, is that going to show us some examples of choreography? Is that what you're pointing at or something? Yeah, that's certainly uh, possible. Can, I'm just can, wondering, is it better to lead into that with a little of the choreography talk or or do you want to show examples first? I think it's, it's interesting to listen to some of the earliest of the uh, sets and order records that I have is 1967. And on it are many of these names that we've just been discussing, Gotcher and Gilmore. It is the uh, sets and order <coughs> Hall of Fame callers. I've, well, I've also got the 1981, which was the Hall of Fame callers, all of them. Uh, so we have examples of all of these names that you just heard. By way of choreography, it, one of the interesting sidelines uh, on that traveling caller scene is that dancers who particularly enjoyed uh, Frank Lane, for instance, when he came through, uh, would go to Bay Path to dance to him, and then, not a big problem, drive 100 miles and go up to Newton to dance to him next Saturday. What they began to discover with a bit of a jolt is that they called an identical dance, word for word. Same jokes, same choreography, same <laughs> dance exactly in both places. And uh, that began to get us a little. Uh, some of the callers stopped, some of the traveling callers wouldn't let anybody tape. Um, who was it? Somebody came in here and called a dance 
And the next night he called in Chicago My and Sanchez, found Sanchez out that the people the who came to that dance that night in Chicago, the Sunday night dance, had already danced the tapes of his Saturday night dance that Sunday morning. Somebody knew something at the airport had taken the tapes down that night, put them on an airplane. They'd gotten to Chicago first thing Sunday morning. They'd all practiced the tapes and knew all his material when he got there. That still exists on the challenge and, circuit. And uh, <laughs> so he wouldn't let anybody tape after that because they were, it, it, it spoiled his program. They already knew exactly what he was going to say. And it was going from, from here to Chicago, that distance. <coughs> this is what taping had been. What a, exactly. Actually, well, uh, that's a sample of what was being danced way back when. It can be found in the uh, first uh, book that Sets and Auto put out called Five Years of Squint Dancing, which was the first five years of the magazine's existence. Uh, all the printed material that they put in the magazine is in that book, the first five years. I have here the, the 1960 training manual for recommended for use for callers and teachers in conducting square dance classes, 1960, Southern California. And in the back of it are your lesson plan and right down to the drill material to call, complete choreography, drill this, material. Is this Osgood? No, 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 no Southern no, California. California. Call Association. Call Association. Right down to the, to the pattern and lines of pattern, oh, okay. rhymes and everything to use, just read it out of the book. The, thing the is, lesson plan tells you what page to look at. They tell you you're going to do box and that. It tells you to go to page 63, and the figure on page 63 is, a, is the pattern using box and that. That's well, 1960. I bought it in 1965 and found it irrelevant at the time. But yeah. <laughs> what I just asked Joanne to go get for me was my little black book from those days. Oh. <laughs> uh, because when you went to a dance, thank you. Uh, the way callers got material was, of course, research, as it is today. <laughs> but in, in those days, we didn't research just bits and pieces that we then put together. We researched entire dances, and they had names. And I devised this wonderful system for, uh, for filing them so that I could, in fact, read them off or, or use them as programming aids. But it, it was nice because you could just flip each little page, and, and each one of these had a name. Uh, got your break, for instance, Johnson's number two. Uh, very often they were named after the source, which seemed like an honorable thing to do. <laughs> Ron's cast off, and, and all those things. But this was my little black book and includes the material. Just for fun, could you read one or two? Yes, I will. I also then swiped from Frank Lane. Yeah, the flip top. Frank Lane came through and he had a really good idea. He had a photo <coughs> album. And what you got here is, is a whole series of calls that followed one after the other, so that you could flip one and do the next one, and then you could just read them right off. And they were big enough prints, so then I could read them. I, I was them out. <laughs> <laughs> this was a very, very good scheme, and you could put them on both the front and the back and, and work them back and forth, and it's a very nice filing system. Uh, you want to read them or you want to walk us through them? Uh, well, uh, I'll read them for openers, and you can decide whether you want to do it. Uh, this one's called, called Ron's Cast Buildup, and it's uh, swiped from Ronnie Schneider, who was one of the Ohio trio. Uh, they were the hot shots. It was Jack Jackson, Ronnie Schneider, and the guy who recorded Big Daddy. Johnny Davis. Johnny Davis. Uh, Big Daddy was the singing call that clinched the life of Wheel and Deal. It, it established Wheel and Deal as a viable call. But uh, Ron Schneider did this one, and the figure was head square through, step between the outside two, cast off three quarters. The ends run, and everybody right and left through. Star through and a left alamant. If that one worked, you then went to front uh, <laughs> <laughs> aid, and the heads wheel around. Star through, center step between the outsides, ends run, cast off three quarters. Cross trail through to a left alamant. And then you could do it with the corner, with the heads wheel around right and left through, star through, Center step between the outsides, cast off three quarters, arch in the middle, and the ends turn in. That was a Gilmore invention. Box the mat in the middle, walk right by to a left alley man. Gilmore used to say, if in doubt, use ends turn in. If you called ends turn in today, the floor would stand there and stare at you. And then I have Ron's cast buildup with two casts and two trades. Uh, square through, step between, cast off three quarters, ends trade, centers pass through, step between the outsides, cast That's off. Late 60s. Uh, yeah, in that ballpark somewhere. We weren't doing cast-offs until the late 60s. 
Then the left swing through buildup with a Dixie chain and Alamo style. Dixie chain. Now known as Dixie style to an ocean wave. Yes, that would be late 60s. Dixie, Dixie style was. Folding clover slide. This is one I, I used as recently as the early 70s with uh, the mainstream opposition club that I ran called Jim's Gems. Uh, heads roll away and square through, four hands. You've got a picture of this one. Uh, everybody slide through. That's a boy, boy, girl, girl slide through. Ends fold, double pass through and clover leaf. Then a double pass through and the lead two, you turn back. Again, boy, boy, girl, girl, all slide through, ends fold, double pass through and clover leaf. Uh, very often in those days, we recognized that things were easier if we developed a pattern and repeated it. And we unconsciously discovered the, the choreographic truth that if you repeat things, you have in all probability either accomplished a zero or a four ladies chain. Uh, that's one of the things that we discovered early on that's a, a useful choreographic pit, bit of knowledge. Uh, if you do anything twice, or three, no, or three gets you in trouble. There are only a couple that work three. <laughs> but uh, anything twice will leave you back uh, pretty much where you were, but with a four ladies chain as the maximum change that you've accomplished. Yeah, yeah. 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 wheel and deal really blew that. You're in trouble. Yeah. you got to go three <laughs> times. Okay. Ed's got a question. Ed Mayo. I think both Jim and Joe uh, are being kind of proud, uh, kind of silent. But uh, back in the days when I started dancing, both uh, Jim and Joe were the hot shot ramrod callers with it. Hush. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we had had, we had, had eight, eight lessons, and they we, they wanted to prepare us for the advanced, more advanced dancing. We went to a tape dance session in some <coughs> house. And they dug out the most advanced material they had. And it was done by a caller called Dick Ledger. Yeah. He was a little hot shot on the like, So don't, 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 uh, he won't admit it, but don't, uh, don't think every, every caller calls what they call today. They changed a great deal. This uh, record is, is the 1980 uh, Sets in Order series, and it includes some of the names we've been talking about here. Uh, first one. The guy that taught me, Ralph Page. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Ralph Page. Traditional call. Bob Osgood Bob Goss, Osgood Third four with a couple below. And the other way round, circle right to the other way round. And the same two couple with a right hand star. And a left hand star the other way around. Active down the outside of the set. This is a contra dance. Turn around the same way, right back home with your partner and your corner. Down the middle in the line of four. What you will discover right away is that diction was not one of our strong points in those days. <laughs> Ed is yours, Ed Gilmore. Thank you. That's kind of an introduction I like. Now you see, I have nothing to live up to. When they get up here and they say, now I want to introduce a caller that needs no introduction, the world's most famous caller, the world's greatest caller, and they say all these things, and then the only thing that could possibly happen is everybody to go home disappointed. <laughs> this way, I made you more from your kind of California. That's the way I like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, bow to partner, and the corner so well, and look for the old left hand, partner, right and right and left hand, right and right and left, go walking round the hall, do a do the partner, men to the middle and start to the left, go one time in the middle of the set, come home, turn partner, ride once and a half around, girl star left in the middle of the town, turn it once around, come home, partner, turn to the right. Then Alam and left your corner, come back one and prominent put your lady fair. You take a little walk, go around the square. Now one and three, go forward and come on back. And then a right and left two and turn around, star through and pass through. Dose it over, full around, then make an ocean wave. Rock it, right and left through and turn to go around. And dive through and star through and then a right and left through. Jim? 
This is a 1980 record, but these are... That's an earlier... Earlier... Recording, yes. Yeah. Earlier choreography. Oh. Here's one that was made in real time in 1980. Two, run a left through the outsides. Roll a half sachet and then pass through till you turn back. Swing through there, my friend. Now turn through the lady fair. Left alibi and you're calling it there. Gonna weave the ring, go in and out around the sink. I'm proud to be in that company. Yeah. <laughs> This was Bruce Johnson from uh, Santa Barbara, California. Come on, get him introduced. Welcome to this special Square Dance documentary in sound. This is Bob Osgood with a unique roundup of some of the outstanding callers of our time. Those you are about to enjoy are all members of the Square Dance Hall of Fame. So turn on your imagination and join us in this festival featuring the extended basics plateau of square dancing. Opening our program from Santa Barbara, California is Hall of Famer Bruce Johnson. Hey, thank you, Bob. There we go, folks. While you bow to the partner and bow to the corner, walk out around the corner, lady. Turn partner left, boys star, girls promenade outside, you pass them once. Well, the meet again, don't pass, so partner left the full turn, the corner of the right, but not too far. Partner left that alley man start, and the back of a boys, a back of start, and walk along and then we'll slip the clutch, left alley man, here we go for the right or left, grand, grand, right or left around the ring, and when you meet her promenade, that they did do, do it. Go walk and she and you, and you get them on home, one and three, to the right or left turn. One of the uh, famous crowd, still calling, recent chairman of Coal Lab, Bob Van Antwerp. Jim, he didn't get to travel much because he was a uh, he was a full time he was the recreation leader for the town of Long Beach, California, mm. and had a pretty active full time job. So he didn't get to travel very much. He came to festivals and would fly in for a weekend and back out again, but. Uh, you didn't hear him traveling on the circuit the way some of the full-time callers did. Do you have less gocher on any of these? Coming up. Okay. Oh, what a bottle on it. Whoa. <laughs> Down to here, we go with a bottle of ram. Ram to right and left. Got a beautiful little girl in the round the town with a big phone up in a little. Sorry about that. Oh, that's not bad. That's not bad. Come on, put a bottle on it. I'm going to get there. It's number two and four hands around. We'll go to my two. I'll get him from somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, back, back in the days, in the early 60s, when the calling, one of our si most serious problems was bouncing. Do that. Uh, every <laughs> time so so some of the setups, the callers had to keep records from bouncing. I'm about a partner, and you corner two and wave to the pretty girl across from you, and one and two go right and left there, while the other two ladies chain. Two, one, and three go right and left there, and the other two ladies chain. Two, one, and four go right and left there, while the other two ladies chain. Now the head splutter wheel around you go, then square through. Four hands around you do and fine. Now circle four and break to a line. Go forward eight and back you reel. Now pass through and wheel and deal. Do a double pass through. First couple go left, next go right. Do a right and left through and turn all around and pass through. Now bend the line and front of the wheel. Now sweep a quarter and star through. Now square it through. Count the four and when you do, give a right to mother and pull her through. And here comes corner, lift on a man and here we go right and left grid. Every time Gotcha came through, for the next two months, everybody sounded like that. <laughs> <laughs> Every right. caller tried to imitate him. Hmm. We talked about Joe Lewis. Mm. Down and heads, go to the red line, move it there tonight, up and back, and pass through 
and wheel and deal do a double pass through. Let centers in and cast off a three quarters right on the move right up and back. Pass on through and ends trade. And same ends run. Cast off three quarters and line moving up and come on back. Pass through and wheel and deal you do and double pass through and then those centers in. Cast off three quarters round to move it up and back and pass through and Callers had a very distinctive sound in those days. You could you could spot them right away, and uh, many of you will recognize this one. Look out, Bob. Spin the top. And go around and left to go around and down. In the promenade to go around to go to the promenade. I'm all around the ring. Take a little lady to go around again. To get back home and to hear me go. Well, I walk all around your corner, lady. Turn a left and around your baby. Side ladies, chain right. To the right, don't get lost. Now the new head ladies chain, three quarters round, I say. Side gents turn that girl, forward six and the back away. Pass through and a wheel and deal. Girls now, half square through. And so, and the two girls break, make a line, go over the back and down. Slip out and man out and man about and You caught that three person wheel and deal, right? Yeah. Yes. Frank Lane. And uh, another gentleman who didn't travel as much, did weekends, but didn't do a, a tour. Uh, one of my favorites, a super nice guy, Arnie Cronenberger. From Glendale, California, ladies and gentlemen, Arnie Cronenberger. Now one and three, bound swing first and third. Move up to the middle and come on back. Now cross trail two, round one. Line of four, go forward eight and a back you go. Center four, do sando. Outside four, left square two. Center's box and end, square two. Three quarter round, find the corner. Left out of man, here we go. Grand old island, and left go round that bank. Go right and left around, you'll meet your own promenade. That girl I'm home. Home you go around the square like back home, and now it's two and four. Move up to the middle. This is the 1967. Yeah, but that, it also tells you the piece of music What's from the jacket, doesn't it? It sounds yeah. very familiar. Boy, I'll tell you, some of this choreography foremost. Oh, yeah, it'll stop everybody today. We didn't have much to work with, you see, so we had to use a lot. <laughs> uh, it's a set to order record. I don't know what it was. Talk, talk, that must be what I mean. If I can interrupt, talking about choreography, and <coughs> the gentleman I'm talking about is Earl Johnson, but Stan Candler, who used to be a member of our association, has a tape that Earl, that he cut from a dance that Earl called in Haverhill, and uh, I think there's only one promenade in the whole dance, and there's nothing but hand turns. And when I started dancing, we had a group of people, and that was the challenge to kind of join our group that you had to get through this piece of, this one piece of music to take the call. And, uh, it was almost impossible, and if I could ever get that, I would like to bring that to one of our tri-state meetings, and if anyone thinks they know how to, knows how to squid in, I will take all bets. Oh, yeah. No but you don't make it through. Uh, you know, we, we didn't talk about the choreography at the time, but, you know, we didn't have columns in those days. We didn't have, we didn't dance in, in what we call columns today. Uh, H.A. Through was a brand new figure. Um, square through came in 1958. Yeah, square through. With, I, when we started to dance, square through had just been accepted as, a, as an acceptable figure. Eight chain through, <coughs> a brand new figure. Brand chain eight, all eight chain were were the were the high level figures of the day. Um, we didn't have columns, so we did very little from those positions. But we didn't use them; they didn't exist. Hand turn hash was mostly. Gocher's hash in the breaks was the was the floor killer. Uh, and the other one was the, uh, we talked with Jim here, a figure called Lines Divide, guaranteed to wipe out a floor. Don, I hate to interrupt, but it, it is 10 o'clock. We have uh, reached the point of 10 o'clock, and uh, we're starting to scratch interest. Uh, <laughs> some, of, some of the interest, I think, of people that were part of it and enjoy reminiscing, some of it from people that weren't but enjoy hearing about it uh, and I think maybe there's food for more of this sometime there's some obvious 
areas that we'd like to get into and, and maybe even dancing some of this stuff and seeing the chronology, chronology of when some of us got into the program versus when some of the calls got in. Um, we have more than adequately filled our, our allotted time tonight, though, and I think the first thing we ought to do is uh, thank these three gentlemen for <laughs> Thank you.